You are listening to Reinvented. I'm your host, Jen Eckhart. You know, so many of us are tied down to a blueprint that's been created for us. You need to get married by a certain age or have kids by a certain age. You work in a dead-end job anyone would say you should be proud of. You live close to what you know because you should be happy there. Well, week after week of Sunday scaries, panic attacks, and anxiety meds, my next guest left his high stakes career in the finance industry to film ABC's The Bachelorette. Everyone laughed at him and thought he was on crazy pills, but that decision led him to true fulfillment and the wildly different life he has today. Jason Tartik is a Wall Street Journal bestselling author of The Restart Road map. He is also host of one of the top business podcasts, Trading Secrets, an entrepreneur of five operating companies, a startup investor, a TV personality as seen on The Bachelorette. I'm out of breath here. And most importantly, a die hard Buffalo Bills fan. Jason, welcome to Reinvented. Oh my God. Thank you so much for having me, Jen. What an intro. And even that, I mean, how do you do that voice like that? Is that like I don't that's, know. that is just an acquired I, talent? Like, do you go to school for that just to I, get your voice talking like that? I did go to journalism school at the University of Florida, but I actually listened to your show because you have a pretty good voice. The only thing I don't have is like the opening bell, like the ding, 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 ding. So, <laughs> the ding, sorry. ding, ding. It's like it's supposed to replicate like uh, we're ringing in like the stock market. Like, yeah, I the love bell's it. Going, you know? You're speaking my language. <laughs> Used to work on the at the Fox Business Network for many years. I spent my career down on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. So I get it. I love the vibe of your show. But but just going back to the Buffalo Bills fan, I do have to start off this interview by saying I'm so sorry that your boys didn't make it to the Super Bowl. I don't mean to rub salt in the wound. That said, I'm super happy to see your boy Damar Hamlin back up on his feet after his scary cardiac arrest incident. I have to know, who are you rooting for in the upcoming Super Bowl? Do you got the Eagles or the Kansas City Chiefs? I got to take the Eagles. It is just a no-brainer for me. Oh. We have too much, of a, too much of a rivalry with the Kansas City Chiefs. It feels like, you know, we should have been there, but they're there. They earned it. Uh, like you said, more importantly than the game, DeMar Hamlin, uh, he's doing well. He's healthy. That's exciting news. The Buffalo Bills just went through a lot this season. And so while we were favored to make it to the Super Bowl at AFC, we certainly didn't. It's disappointing. But I'm that fan who bought the ticket well in advance to go to the Super Bowl. <laughs> so even though my boys aren't playing on Tuesday, I'm taking off and I'll be in Phoenix. All right. So I, I have to know, I live in New York City. That's where you and me originally met. Yeah. I have to know, are New Yorkers allowed to root for the Buffalo Bills or is that weird? Because I will say like Philly is a lot closer than Buffalo. And I saw in the paper that two New York teams were made it to the NFL playoffs. And I almost had to do a double take. I was like, wait, what? Because sometimes you do forget that. Oh, yeah. Buffalo is in New York. But I'm also so accustomed to the Jets royally sucking so I guess I just have to know, are people in New York City allowed to jump on the Bills bandwagon next year since the Jets are just a lost cause? I mean, this is how the Buffalo Bills roll in the Bills Mafia. We are not judgy. We don't. We welcome everyone and anyone. You want to come on train and support the small city and small town of Buffalo, New York, we will take <laughs> you. You can't judge us. We won't judge you. Come prepared to drink. Come prepared to have a good time. You might get thrown through a table or two, but you know what? Just get uh, buckle up because we okay. like to have a good time. Work hard, okay. play hard. Well, that's the last. I was going to ask, though, why do you guys? I've tried to figure this out mathematically and it doesn't make any sense to me. Why do you guys throw yourselves into tables and spray ketchup at each other every single Sunday? I mean, don't get me wrong. I think it's awesome. <laughs> I'm just trying to understand the meaning behind it. I don't know that there's much meaning other than like <laughs> Buffalonians just love to have a good time. Okay. And I think what happened is one person did it. It caught attention. And because just Buffalo was getting attention, especially when our team sucked, we just <laughs> went on board with it. Now, one of the things we did before I saw anyone ever jump on a, a through a table, it was called the chairway to heaven. This was before this was before table breaking. Someone would sit on a lawn chair and they would intentionally like sit casually, hands behind their head, drinking a beer. Right. Someone about 20 yards away would throw the ball up. They would have to try and catch it while sitting. And meanwhile, at least five guys are coming full speed to tackle you. 
Oh, it wow. Okay. The stairway to heaven. So yeah. at least I think we've improved on things and now it's just table breaking and table smash. Okay. So I have to know, are you friends with Gronk? Because I believe he's from Buffalo, but you two are like the only two guys I know from, actually the only two people I know from the Buffalo area. Are you guys friends? And would you let him throw you into a table? We are friends and I would 100% let him throw me through a table. It'd be like a WWE scene. And in fact, next Wednesday, when I go to the Super Bowl, I'm going to see him and I'm having him on the podcast. So maybe as a TikTok, there you go. I'll, find, I'll find a table and have him choke slam me through it. It'll be a great I scene. love it. That's great. And we're teasing it here on Reinvented. Gronk's coming on the Trading Secrets podcast. So there you go. There go. Everyone love wins. That. Okay, last football question. I promise my viewers and listeners, I'm getting into why Jason is on the reinvented podcast, but Tom Brady just announced his retirement like two seconds ago, as did Ozzy Osbourne. Like what's happening? Everyone's retiring now. Uh, do you care about Tom Brady retiring? Are you over the Giselle and Tom drama? Where do you fall in line with this? Ozzy's retiring. Tom's retiring. I mean, literally the world's ending and we are witnessing it. Um, a couple things. So one greatest of all time, so much fun to watch him. I wish that we knew a little bit more than just a random story he put out on Twitter. I would have loved the anticipation of like knowing you are witnessing the greatest of all time quarterback play their last game. Like right. I just would have paid more attention to it. And I wish there was just a little bit more of a climatic ending. You um, wanted that, like a, you wanted a LeBron James, like the decision type thing, right? Where he yeah, sits I down. Just, well, yeah. I, I would have loved to know before, like, the, like I would have loved him to say, this is my last season. Come right. enjoy me. Come watch, yeah. come interact with me. It's going to be different. And I right. think just as a, as a viewer and a fan, I felt, I feel like, Obviously, we got a lot from him, but like I want just a little more before he goes. Yeah. That's that's my take on it. it. The whole Giselle it. thing, that's what's so fascinating. It's clearly some some things being ruffled before the season. I mean, we saw that with his interviews. Yep. But the big question mark is if you're retiring now when you're still capable of playing at an elite level, why didn't you just hang him up the year before and just focus on yeah. that? I guess the timing's the a little answer. peculiar. Only weird. answer would be that they knew it was over before the season started, right? Yeah, that's true. You mean knew their marriage was over before the season yeah, started? Yeah. Right. Otherwise, why would you retire a year later? You would just give up last season. Last season was a throwaway. Yeah. Yeah, that and I think she just did this whole spread in a magazine coming out talking about Tom's. Career. Anyway, it's all interesting. It's a little it's the timing is fascinating to me. I agree with you. I think more people wouldn't have phoned it in. They would have paid more attention to him had they been given a heads up. So I kind yeah. of agree with you. So yeah. anyway, Jason. You back to why I actually have you on the show. Enough about Tom Brady. I don't know if you know this, but you and I have extraordinarily similar life stories and themes of our podcast shows, which is this idea of reinvention and restarting one's career path. I recently had a good friend of mine on this show, the front man of the Smashing Pumpkins, Billy Corgan on. We were discussing the lyrics of his song, which I'm sure you know, it's Bullet with Butterfly Wings. And it's like, despite all my rage, I'm still just a rat in a cage. Now, much like you, Jason, I found myself in a cage in the corporate world in my early 20s. And I don't know about you, but I have no interest in being a sheep. I never liked the idea of having corporate overlords tell me who I can or cannot talk to or interview, telling me to steer away from certain talking points. So I had no problem going out on a limb and starting my own show using podcasting as a medium to share inspirational stories that you otherwise would never hear about on the news. Now, you, after 10 years of working in corporate banking, you took a detour, and it was quite a detour, into the world of reality television to be a contestant on season 14 of ABC. Sees the Bachelorette. Tell us about your personal journey of reinvention and your career before going into reality TV. I even remember when when we met and you told me that your you told me your story briefly and then you told me that your podcast is reinvented and I was like no way because we even have like similar names so reinvented I'm yeah. wearing a, a hoodie right now this is We're the talent management be. company I called Rewired the yeah. book behind me is called The Restart Roadmap and we're and, reinvented and you are reinvented I know and we I, should go like, into business together there's so much overlap here <laughs> I love it and to the question I think it's it's 
it's a it's a great question. And and, and your point about what you experienced um, is very similar to what I experienced. I think you know I do therapy too, so I'm a big proponent of therapy. And the 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 more therapy I do, the more I understand the whole concept of like your inner child. And I think my inner child, especially was always consuming from family members and community. And what I saw was stay in this line of what we deem successful and you will be successful. And that's all I did. Right. Right. I did all the things by the book, you know, be well-rounded, be the captain of the team, be nice to everybody, uh, study what you're supposed to study, go to business school, get your MBA. You could run for president. That's how I mean, people would vote for you. Just so you know. (laughs) (laughs) That's amazing. Well, you have some political background, so I actually there's some credibility behind that. I'll take it. But it's all those things, right? It's all those things that was my life. And up until 29, I did it all. Like literally my boss would say, "Okay, we got a great opportunity. You want to continue to move up? in this company. We need you to move from New York to Seattle, even though you know no no one. 3,000 plus miles. Are you willing to go? Me, corporate soldier. Yes, sir. And I went. <laughs> and then I got to a point, like it was this, this, this weird thing where the bachelor, of all things to shake me, ABC The Bachelor comes knocking on my door and says, hey, we, 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 are you still single? And do you live in New York? Well, I'm still single. I live in Seattle. And so I was like, they were interested in me applying. And it was the first thing that I really wanted to do that did not fit into that line of what is successful. And every person I looked up to, every mentor I had internally and externally, every close friend, everyone told me, dude, what are you doing? You got a (laughs) rocket on your back. You got it all going for your 29. You're killing it. You're going to be the next executive. You're going to be the next C-level at a big bank. What are you fucking doing? Like, wake up. Sorry, I don't know if I could swear. No, no. Oh, we welcome swearing. It's okay. Good. We keep and it then, and I said no. It was like one of the first times I went outside the line for me and my happiness. And once I went outside that line, that to bring it back to this podcast, that was my reinventing moment. And not only will I never go back inside of that line, I get triggered when people try to put me back into that line. Right? I love it. So I that's so the identify with that. Totally identify with that. So I have to know, was your family supportive of your more unconventional career choice? I'm just, I'm trying to think of how my family would react if I was like, hey guys, I know I have great benefits. I'm going to quit my nine to five and go on a reality dating show. Like what was their initial reaction? Of course they didn't support it. (laughs) Now, Caitlin's story is totally different. Like, so Caitlin Bristow is my fiance, former bachelorette, winner dancing with the stars, big in reality TV too. Uh, Her family was like, yeah, go for it. This is what you're made to do. My family was like, what? What the hell are you doing? <laughs> like, no, you're not it. going on there. And if you do go on there, don't think we're coming to hometowns because you're not dragging us into this shit. Oh, man. So I they love were it. very supportive. Uh, and, and even like, you know, after I got off the show, they were extremely. So once I made the decision and they did come to hometowns and they ended up supporting me, it was all talk, no walk. But then <laughs> there's another conversation to be had. Like once I got off the show, what happens? And I went back to work for a year and there were a lot of balancing acts and supporting yeah. the entrepreneurial life and the corporate life and this reality TV personality life. And they don't uh, mix well. <laughs> they don't it's mix like oil well. And water. They eventually, they eventually blow up. So right. uh, there's a lot more to that story. But to answer your question, um, at first, no, and they have come full circle. Well, good. I'm glad. And they seem to love your fiance, Caitlin Bristow, of which I am a huge fan of. You know, Jason, I have so much respect and admiration for you and that you did sort of find your own way and pave your own path, which is very similar to what I've done. And it's often what society tells us not to do. I've always believed society tricks us into believing that like folks who achieve great success at an early age are otherworldly or magical. But the truth is, and my viewers and listeners have heard me share on this show that the vast majority of people don't achieve success until much later in life. Some might be ringing the bell at the New York Stock Exchange, while others might be ringing the cancer-free bell. Now, I have to ask you, as an accomplished person who, so I'm 32, you're 34, I believe. Yeah. As an accomplished person who have reached enormous success at your young age, what are your thoughts on the Forbes 30 under 30 list? Because I wrote a scathing op-ed. I wouldn't say scathing, but like each year Forbes comes out with that list, I cringe. I'm just like, oh my God. Because I feel like we're so used to having young people succeed at an earlier and earlier and earlier age. What are your, Where do you fall in line with that? Oh, 
in general, I'm not a big fan of these like subjective lists that are often driven by, you know, PR bureaucracy in politics. Like even, you know, like a New York Times bestseller list. Like I went up, down, left and right to understand it. I could only tell you anyone that makes a New York Times bestseller list based on the genre, it's after one week of sales. And for the business segment, it's after one full month of sales. Then the list comes out. Other than that, you can't crack the code. It is so subjective. So in general, I'm just not a huge fan of lists that are based on subjectivity and that's not objective. I do see some of these lists though. And you go down the list and you see some people that are like outrageously qualified that you're like, Mm -hmm. Oh my God, look at this person. Look at their story. I want to learn from it. I want to get to know them more. And you find out their daddy's like the tech CEO of like the company. (laughs) In most cases. Yeah. (laughs) But there, there is, you know, once in a while on on the list, there's someone you're like, wow, that's amazing. But in general, I'm just not a big fan of the Forbes 30 under 30 lists. I love Um, it. And I love someone. I love someone that's done it differently. That's broke the blueprint and did it without mom, dad, sister, cousin, or uncle. Let's just be real. Like it's it's a yeah. lot of bullshit. Like yeah. you're you know, if you have done what you've done and accomplished what you've done, um, that's your list. Not yep. someone in a I don't know, a random, you know, who knows, random office probably being paid off by some PR firm that's deciding who's on this list because there are like many people that are involved in benefiting off. It. Well, and that's part of why I started this show because I want to say to the guy with big entrepreneurial dreams out there who's like saddled with student debt, hey man, you can still launch that dream. You can still launch that company. Or the woman who wants to, you know, who just scored her first book deal at age 70, you know, who's a mom of three. It's never too late in life to sort of change career trajectories. So it's never too late. And then when you start dissecting, Jen, you start dissecting like some of the ins and outs of like how people landed, like this big magazine thing or like where they landed it. There's literally so many backdoor dollars being spent and angled. And the point is like, don't let the facade of other people intimidate you because if it does, then their bullshit's working. Forget about that. Be the best version of you. Go get it. Go ask for it because no one's going to come to you and give it to you. I want my viewers and listeners to purchase a copy of your amazing Wall Street Journal bestselling book, The Restart Roadmap. Without giving too much away, can you give my listeners, you know, it says that you sort of put forth a blueprint on how one can rewire and restart their career. Like, for example, my best friend Kaylee just the other day said, hey, I'm leaving my comfy a uh, job at Amazon, a top tech giant, and decided to go all in and pursue her passion on interior design. Is there a formula to follow when switching directions? The one thing you have to do is master the pivot and you have to get out of old habits. And I think the biggest thing is you have to be self-aware and vulnerable. You have to stop putting up this mask that everyone, you think everyone else wants to see. And you have to stop writing your story according to what your boss wants to see, your mom, dad, brother, sister, whoever it may be. You have to sit down and understand yourself to the core. What drives your happiness? What are your skill sets? How can you accelerate where you are today the way you want to and not the way someone else is going to question you? Mm. And until you can really understand yourself down to the bedrock of who you are as a person and what truly drives just you, you won't be able to find that direction. So before I start pointing and throwing resumes and trying to network and doing all these things that people on TikTok and Instagram will tell you to do, you need to pause and you need to do a lot of self-reflection. Find what is going to light you up internally. Then once you do that, there are 8 million paths to take. And across all those paths, there's so many shortcuts. And you want to start with the top, work your way down. And I think this book gives you a really good strategy for each step of the restart process from looking internally all the way to landing the place you want to be at the industry you want to be working in. Well, I finally purchased a copy. I will say, having left corporate media uh, after working there for about 10 years, I wish I did have a copy of your book when I decided to switch career paths, but it's okay. It all came full circle, and now I'm interviewing you on my podcast. So, Jason, you are a numbers guy, having worked in finance for many years. You earned your MBA in accounting and finance and executed over $150 million in lending transactions. Well done. I have to know, what advice would you give to someone who just started working when it comes to managing their finances? Ooh, just started working to managing their finances. Uh, The step one, meet with the HR director that is at the company that you're working at. You said the H word? HR? Here's why. Here's why. 
the HR director or if someone in HR is in charge of all the different contractors they have to work with outside of the company that brings employee benefits. Okay. They're not going to tell you about all of them. I guarantee your company has some type of financial insurances or benefits or stock purchase plan or match that you're unaware of. You need to know every single benefit they offer to you and you need to completely suck that dry. So mm. personal finances, new company, meet with HR, only for that reason, to get the <laughs> benefits and to make sure you take advantage of it. The second thing I'm going to tell you, I've had all different kinds of earnings, uh, lower and higher. And not, what you earn, that's financial offense. That's super important. But in today's day and age, especially with inflation, you need solid defense. You really have to understand your cash outflows. Where is your money going and why? We see it all the time. We see athletes. We see huge businessmen and women with massive exits. We see big investment bankers and hedge fund managers go broke. You can make a million dollars, 10 million, 100 million. And if you are not managing your cash outflows effectively, you will go broke. There's, wow. there's no doubt about it. We just saw an interview with, with Ocho Cinco talking about hit that lifestyle that all of his peers were, try, were trying to keep up with. 10 years into it, they're broke. You can't keep up with it. He talked right. about the fact he had fake jewelry, fake Rolexes, fake everything. Because I'm not spending that money. Right. So the idea is you have to understand your cash outflows. And I could keep going, but I'll, I'll take a pause there and, and, and let you ask the no, next question. I get great, fired up about this Great, topic. No, great advice. I think you're such a great sounding board when it comes to personal finance. I have to know, would you recommend, you got your MBA, would you recommend for someone to get an MBA who's out there listening to this show? Or do you consider it a waste of time and money? Because I know like Tesla CEO, SpaceX CEO, Elon Musk once said, I believe he said this, he goes, try to avoid hiring MBAs. MBA programs don't teach people how to create companies. And I always found that very interesting. Now, my brother James got his MBA. You got your MBA. There's nothing against wrong with, you know, pursuing one. But do you think that there's any truth to that? Is it sort of a waste of time and money? I, what do you think? I mean, it go to my LinkedIn profile and right under my name, the first thing that says is overpriced MBA, ex-banker gone entrepreneur. I mean, it, <laughs> it was great. such a ridiculous amount of money that I spent for that MBA. And I'm, if I'm looking internally, the only reason I got my MBA was because I was told I was supposed to and for a credential. Like I was a young mm. kid in a larger role. Right. So I thought if I told people I had my MBA, it would give me some credit, right? Right. Right. The thing is, is it, it, it's, it's irrelevant. There's almost nothing that I learned in that MBA program that I apply today. The most important process of it was the relationships I built. built. Of course. Yeah. And, and just like the professors I got to know. Other than that, no. I'll, I'll, I will say this. Uh, we're still in a period of time where if you do go to a top 10 MBA program, mm -hmm. that is where the biggest and best employers with the biggest checkbooks are coming to recruit. So right now, if someone comes to me, a kid comes to me and says, I am trying to get my MBA. Do you think I should go? Should I go full-time? Should I go part-time? The first question I'm going to ask, what school is it? And are they top 10? And if they're not, I'm going to say, unless literally you're doing it for you because you absolutely want to be educated and you're not doing it for the MBA or the, the soundboard or the credibility, you're just doing it for you. I would not go. And the last comment I want to make is it's just crazy the way that things have evolved in this world. You had mentioned Elon Musk, right? Automobile yep. industry. Look yep. where we are. The cars drive for us. Telecommunications industry. Look how we communicate versus where we did 100 years ago. Look at manufacturing. You got 3D freaking printers out there, right? I mean, look how everything's evolved. Yep. Why is it? That education system hasn't changed at all. The first college was Harvard or 1626, almost 400 years ago. And it's still the same. We still sit in a classroom with one professor and a chalkboard and chalk and learn. That has got to evolve. And we are way behind our time. So uh, I am more anti-MBA than pro-MBA. And that's someone who spent six figures to get an MBA. Listen, I think higher education is a lot of what's wrong with America. So you're speaking my language. And I just I had to get your take on that. As, as a proud MBA student, um, I love the fact that you say, oh, what did you say? Overpriced and what? Yeah, I think I'm going to look it up right now so I don't misquote it. LinkedIn, here we go. Uh, go check me out, LinkedIn, Jason Tardick. Overpriced MBA and ex-banker gone entrepreneur. 
gone entrepreneur <laughs> and reality star show. <laughs> exactly. You wear many hats. You know, the million dollar question I have to address and no, everyone relax. I'm not asking about Jason's wedding. Jason, I know you're, I know you're so tired of hearing about that. Not going to go there. You can breathe easy. I have to ask about this Dubai trip. You recently went on with your brother to see the $24 million performance heard around the world from Beyonce. Now, I know that everyone may not agree with your decision to travel there, but you know, I'm pretty sure alcohol is illegal. THC, CBD is illegal. Uh, going on any website that has porn, I think is illegal. It's also illegal to be gay there. Now, Jason, you're very vocal about being supportive of women and gay rights, but you still chose to travel to Dubai, which is an ex extremely oppressive. Were you at all nervous being there? Yeah, I mean, as far as like what, when it relates to safety, not in the least bit. I didn't feel uh, at all times, I felt extremely safe. And I think it's very fair to say like, this was a very privileged trip where we had a ton of, you know, security and eyes on us to make sure that we were in safe hands. So we felt safe, um, you know, and just as far as like, I mean, the restrictive madness that happens over there, it's, it's a humanitarian nightmare. I mean, it's, yeah. it's terrible what is going on there and what is illegal and how outlandishly restrictive everything is. So I think when you are a traveler and a visitor, you have to weigh those things and understand those things. And I totally support people that would say they don't want to travel somewhere that uh, has those rules in place. You know, for me, I also look at like the Western world in general, and hopefully our progress is a precedent for other areas like Dubai. And when we go there and my brother goes there, who's happily, uh, you know, he's, he's, he's gay, he's a married man. We, you know, there's a lot to be said for that. It's almost like, we are we are showing who we are and you too should see who we are and hopefully that same progress happens here and there's still also a lot of power to be said for you know beyonce's on stage and, and yes that i'm sure she, i know she got a ton of backlash for taking that deal but she's on stage and she has a full there wasn't one person on stage with her that wasn't a female I'm pretty sure all the dancers were brought in from Lebanon and the orchestra was an all female orchestra, I believe from all different parts of Europe. And she's singing about women, women empowerment, empowerment. Yeah. and progress and yeah. all the things and independence and all the things that we want to make sure that are being stated. And the Royal family was there watching and they're paying $24 million to support those lyrics and that art. And there's something to be said for that art to be heard around the world and in places that need to make changes. So, um, yeah, that's uh, it's a loaded question. We could probably do a whole podcast on oh, that. Yeah. Well, and you um, did on Trading Secrets. People could check it out. Jason put out a fascinating episode that I listened to with his brother. His brother, I think, is a marketing executive and put forth all, all the numbers and metrics behind like the impressions on social media that her performance generated. And look, from a dollars and cents perspective, I get it. I get the business behind it. But on a personal level, I mean, the, tri the trip looked and sounded insane. I do follow you on social media. My favorite part was the fact that Fat Joe and Ja Rule were on the same plane home as you from Dubai. What was that like? <laughs> it was amazing. So real quick on the, uh, the ROI, I had the PR firm reach out to me after that episode. They're like, oh, I wish we had talked before. And I was like, why? Just in United States, I want you to take a stab at this and then I'm going to, I'll talk about the Fat Joe thing. Just in the United States, how many impressions do you think they made from the marketing blitz that weekend? I would say a million, a couple million. They, well, so just from my, I had to send her a report just from my social media with all the things I did, I was able to make uh, about 7.7 .7 million impressions just to put in perspective. Just you. Wow. Yeah. They made 28 billion impressions in the United States. So if you think about eyeballs, eyeballs right. just coming across content, that is an impression. You go on Twitter, you look at what's trending, you've been impressed. Um, so 28 billion. But if you do that on average, it's literally like 90 impressions per American, uh, assuming every American is like watching this stuff in a four or five day period. It's mind blowing. That is so crazy. it's just crazy what they did marketing wise. Very impressive. Uh, back to Fat Joe. We're in the, you know, we're, <laughs> we're flying Emirates, sitting down, shot, really tired after a long trip. 
and he comes fat Joe and everything you would expect. Right. He's got the sweatsuit on that's yep. matching head to toe. He's just killing it. He's vibing. His hands are up. He's <laughs> dancing. He's like, let's go. We're going to party on this. We are going to party on this plane. And he points at it. Like I thought he was like pointing at me. And I was like, what? Turned around I don't know you fat rule. Joe. <laughs> but he was pointing behind me. And he said, I'll see you at the back of the plane. I'm like, there's no way he's talking to me. I don't know. And then and I hear that voice of Ja Rule. He's like, yeah, man, I'll see you. And I look back and I'm like, oh my God, it's Ja Rule. So Ja Rule and Fat Joe were on the same plane. It was great. A same plane as you. I Party bet in it, the back. <laughs> that's amazing. If I could have just been like a fly on that Emirates flight, that was just so, so awesome. You know, in looking at your social media, Jason, you come across very unapologetically confident. And if you're not, I mean, you do an excellent job of hiding it. One of the things I love most about you and your relationship with Caitlin Bristow is that you guys always keep it real. I mean, Caitlin even shares pictures of herself crying, discussing her mental health. You got you shared at the beginning of this interview that you're a big proponent of therapy. Do you ever deal with fear or doubt? And if so, how do you overcome it? Yeah. I mean, I, I deal with fear and doubt every single day. It's, it's a 24 seven thing. And if people don't deal with fear, or doubt, I think truly they're just lying and they're, they're finding different coping mechanisms to not um, showcase that. But all throughout the day. I mean, the human brain has over 70,000 thoughts in one day. You're telling me in those 70,000 thoughts, you're not questioning yourself or what you do or how you do it. And I think the thing is, is that you want to find ways to not let fear drive your behavior. And you want to find ways to find more comfort within yourself that you do can start to reduce the amount of doubt, that you can start to increase the amount of security you have, that you can sit in a room no matter who's in that room or where you are and not think, am I underdressed? Am I overdressed? Do I look right? Am I standing right? Am I speaking right? Am I being perceived right? The more that you can create confidence within yourself, uh, the better you'll be perceived. And the only way I think to create confidence within yourself is to know yourself. And that's why I'm, I just, I talked about being a proponent about therapy is because the more I go to therapy, I love it. I am a frugal guy. I spend a lot of money on therapy and it is the, I'm like excited to spend the money because every time I step out of there, I know myself better. And when I know myself better, I'm more confident. When I was in these banking role, I was trying to be everything they wanted me to be, wear the right suit, wear the right tie, sit the right posture, write the right way, look them in the eye, all the things I had to do, check the box. I started to lose myself. I started carrying so much weight on my shoulders, trying to live up to the expectation of what they wanted me to be that I lost myself. And that's when your confidence goes to shit. So that you got to start within, you got to understand yourself. And if someone doesn't like it too fucking bad, that's yeah. who you are. And that's yeah. what makes you special. And th until you kind of really dig into that, you'll never get to the pinnacle of where you could get. And even someone like myself who feels comfortable there, I have so much more fucking work to do. So yeah. much more work. Caitlin, who you just said, like you find extremely vulnerable and extremely relatable. She is. And even her, she just went on a seven day therapy retreat. I know in Hawaii, like to find herself or well, had Hawaii, like a spiritual Hawaii guide. Was after. So it's just like, it's very intensive. You'll have to catch her podcast. It's off the vine. She'll talk all about it. Her story, not mine. Seven days though, no phone, no TV, no internet. You start therapy at seven. You end it at the end of the night. And it is very, very aggressive inner child work uh, and, mm -hmm. and looking inside. And so- even her, who's so connected and so vulnerable and so open, still knows there's so much work to be done. Yeah. So anybody that's in denial to that, um, I challenge you. You know, I hate people who are like, new year, new me. I find them so annoying. I've sadly <laughs> become one of those people. Uh, and yes, I did hire Jason, a personal trainer at the start of January. Thank you for asking. But before you commend me on my efforts to get into kick-ass shape, check back in with me in like another month or so just to see if I'm st <laughs> we're still working out together. But so far, so good. So far, it's going well. I am curious, and I know my viewers and listeners out there are as well. What are three goals you have for yourself in 2023. Oh my gosh. I have so many. <laughs> oh man. I, I think Can the you name three with, of them. I'm going to name of, I'm going to name a few of them. The, the, okay. um, the big thing with goals is I think they have to be measurable. If they're not measurable, how is there a baseline for what you're achieving? Uh, one of my goals I just accomplished was get through uh, dry January. 
to me, I'm a, I am love drinking. I'm a big social drinker. If I'm with you, let's go have a drink. And I didn't have one drink in January in all situations with the Bills losing, partying in Dubai oh, to Beyonce, uh, et cetera. So, so that was, uh, that was well, a big good, one. Well, good, alcohol is like kind of illegal in Dubai. So I guess that kind of worked to your advantage there for dry January, no? That that worked for, yeah. Well, no, everyone was, <laughs> again, so in the Middle East and, in you know, and specifically, uh, you know, that country, it's, it is illegal to do a laundry list of things. And Dubai is less, the way I would probably characterize it, less restrictive. And it's less restrictive because they know that 20% of their economy is driven by tourism. Mm. So the rules yeah. that you know of by the book don't really exist, at least in the area we were traveling in right. Dubai. Um, okay. So that's one. Dry January, nailed that. And yes, there was alcohol everywhere, especially at that Beyonce show. They had the unbelievable bottles of champagne and wine pouring like water. And I was like, no, oh, oh, but I made you, it. Yeah. The second one is I'm trying to gain trying to gain 18 pounds of muscle mass. So trying to get to 200 pounds with a, you know, a, a certain target, uh, body fat weight, et, et cetera. So Wait, to do, do you that, have a personal it, trainer too. Are we alike? I have, I have some buddies who are personal trainers, so okay. they'll give me oh, workouts okay. and then I just go by myself, but we were okay. in this together. You know, I'm trying to lift at least five, six times a week. And, wow. and I know it sounds ridiculous, but it's the opposite of like, you know, your standard diet. It's actually consuming so much. So you have to just like crush three protein shakes and all these grams of protein. And it's like, oh, and you get sick of just eating chicken. So it's a lot, but I'm getting there. And then I'll give you a financial goal. I'll give you a, yeah, financial goals. We're trying to double the revenue of our talent agency. I'm extremely open with numbers on trading secrets. That's all we do is talk about money. Did about two and a half million in gross revenue last year. And we're putting a plan in place to do about 5 million this year. So hopefully we can hit that. And then the last thing I'll say is in general, just be happier. Like if you measure your happiness score one through 10 on a daily basis, uh, you can keep track of it and just really understand like what in your life is truly driving your happiness up because the happier I am, the better I'm at work, the better partner I am, the better everything I am. And so finding ways to just continue to try and increase my overall happiness is a big one for 2023. Those are great goals. Thank you so much for sharing those with us. I have a confession to make. Hopefully we can still be friends and you won't judge me too harshly for this, but mm -hmm. I have literally only ever watched two seasons of The Bachelorette. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I watched Trista's season. She was awesome. like the OG, the She's queen the Trista. And I watched your fiance, Caitlin Bristow's, of which you weren't even on, but you two are now engaged to be married. So it feels like it kind of worked out for everyone in the end. I had to consult with my good friend, Stephanie Ginn, who I jokingly refer to as my correspondent for all things Bachelor Nation. She freaked out when she learned I was interviewing you because you are like her <laughs> personal hero. And she did have a few Bachelor related questions for you. Sure. Are you ready? Bring them on. Bring okay. them on. Let's do it. Are you watching this upcoming season? And if so, what advice would you give to a contestant? So I have, there are two episodes in, I haven't watched one minute. At some point I will. Okay. I don't know which episode I'll get involved in. Okay. My advice to Zach would be plain and simple, throw out the bachelor handbook, all the cliches, go out the window and just be yourself. I do feel like the little I've seen, it feels as though he's trying a little bit too hard. Shake it off. It's not easy to do in front of cameras and millions of people. But the second you drop into the real Zach, not the bachelor cliche Zach, you are going to crush it and you are going to connect with people and audiences like you never imagined. Okay. I like that. Uh, so will that and wear comfy shoes to the rose ceremony? Obviously. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, <laughs> wait, wait, is that, did that happen this season or something? I didn't see these two. No, episodes. no. Oh. I just remember reading an interview when I was doing some deep dive research on you and you said somewhere like I would wear comfier shoes to the roast. Oh, ceremony. I mean, that's true. <laughs> roast ceremonies are literally like two hours. It's your stand. You know what you get worried about? Like one thing I was worried about is like, am I going to like fall over? I'm just because like people, you know how like people at weddings, like when they stand too long and can find they areas, faint. people they just pass, pass out. out. Yeah. You're up there for two and a half hours just standing. <laughs> so the whole time you could like see everyone's just kind of like going back because everyone's nervous. Everyone's going right. back and forth and production will come in. And, All right, stop moving everybody. We're filming. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> I love it. So comfy shoes, Zach, if you're watching and listening, comfy shoes, Jason says. Com so comfy shoes. Do you have any regrets during your time as a contestant on The Bachelorette? This one I found interesting. Let's see. What is... Come on, I give think, the people yeah, what they I'll want, you, Jason. I'll give you one. I don't think I've okay. talked about this one. Okay. Um, 
I I still struggle with this a little bit. I'm not good with showcasing my emotions to people. Like, I don't like when people feel bad for me. I don't like people to feel sorry for me. And so sometimes, and it's something I still work on, it's like I over put on a front of everything's great, everything's fine, even if I'm hurting. And I do remember I was in a lot of pain when I got dumped in that moment, right? Got back, got on my toes, all everything worked out. But I was in a lot of pain. And instead of like just feeling that pain and like letting loose, all I was doing was fighting it. And all I was doing, don't cry, don't cry, don't cry, don't cry. Cameras, cameras, don't cry, don't cry. Don't show your emotion, don't show your emotion. So I just like held it together, held it together, held it together, held it together. And then the second everyone was gone and production was gone, I fucking sat in my room for like six hours bawling my eyes out. Wow. And I think back at that, I'm like, why are you, what's the issue there? Like, why are you hiding it so much that you're in pain? Like, it's okay to be in pain. A lot of people are in pain. Like, why are you trying to hide this tough guy persona? And so if I have any other regret, I probably would have shown my emotional colors more as opposed to trying to camouflage them. I love that. Thank you for being vulnerable and sharing that. And here I'm thinking, I don't watch the show because it's all fake. You didn't really have feelings for Becca, but you did. And I mean, it was all real. It wasn't smoke and mirrors. Yeah, I mean, well, listen, you're, you're, you're into this like very tight bubble. Like, you know, two, two, three months of no family, no friends, no no outside communication, no internet, no TV, no music. Uh, that individual you're seeing is like literally the only like person of the opposite sex you're seeing. So right. they create a situation in which I think like your feelings are extremely magnified and accelerated. I'll say the second, like when I got out of it and like you kind of pop that bubble and then also right. when you watch it back and you start to see, holy <laughs> shit, she, she was really into all these other dudes. Uh, it's like instant. Okay, that's good. That was a part of my life. Chapter closed. What's my that? boyfriend did tell me, he's like, Jason, I remember didn't do the fantasy suite. He I was like against that. Dinner. I got dumped at dinner right before the fantasy suite. <laughs> oh, 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 okay. All right. right. I stand corrected. We were like talking. We had this big talk. And then like literally she left and then she came back. And when she came back, she broke up. Oh. And I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't see that coming. Left hook. All right. Well, you know, my question that's totally unrelated to The Bachelor is your fiance, Caitlin Bristow, won ABC's Dancing with the Stars. When can we see you on Dancing with the Stars? I think I asked you this also when I first met you in New York City. So when can we see you, Jason? I'm waiting. I'm waiting. <laughs> I've learned a couple dance moves from Caitlin here and there. I've One seen. One thing I, I, I got to give, I think the, the if I gave any recommendation to the Bachelor franchise is that they need to get back on building a community. They need to get back on incorporating and bringing in their alumni and cast. You have a lot of people out there, a lot of alumni that are doing really big things on their own and they kind of bring you in the cycle and kick you out in two seasons removed from when you've been on two, three seasons. It's likely they're not coming back to you. Uh, Kate was the exception. I'm so excited for her, but you look at like some of all the other networks like Bravo and what they've done with Real Housewives and uh, the way they do Bravo Con. And you look at like Summer House and Winter House. And I just think there's so much they could do with alumni that they I don't agree. do. And just that, like even like like tweeting, I like the tweets. No one from no alumni is like involved in the show anymore because mm. they're not like part of it anymore. And I think that's one piece of feedback I'd probably I'd probably give to the show is like integrate, integrate some way, somehow your alumni there continue right. to build the community get people more involved. And from that, the show will continue, I think, to succeed. But well, speaking yeah. of shows, you and Caitlin, I mean, have you thought of doing your own reality show? Like I'm thinking in my mind, like similar to newlyweds, like Nick Lachey and Jessica Simpson, like two cute golden retrievers. Like I'd, I'd sign up to watch that. Yeah, I think uh, so. Caitlin's stance on it is uh, given her time on reality TV I don't think she would want to do another relationship focused show is my understanding. So, I mean, I'd be I'm down for pretty much anything. You're I'd be like, so yeah, let's down do for it. it. <laughs> let's give it a go. And she was, she was like, no, we're not no. doing that. I'm like, all right. Next. Okay. <laughs> All right. I get it. Well, look, you and your fiance are both successful entrepreneurs in your own right. Do you see yourselves doing any business ventures together in the future? Yeah, I could see that. I mean, we haven't to date. Um, she's coming on the podcast on my podcast for the hundredth episode, which is going to be exciting. And yeah, I think we could, I think there might be something in the future. Okay. I see, I see something we do. 
we do a ton of work together already. Like I, yeah. I help consult with all the finances of her companies. And uh, I would say 90% of deals she's looking at, she has me review and uh, negotiate and help her with prior to executing them. And then also the talent management group we have has placed tons of deals uh, with her, which is exciting. So we already kind of do, but I see some bigger things in the future. Perhaps something in Dancing with the Stars. Well, we can't have her back on Dancing with the Stars. What I would love is for Caitlin to host Dancing with the Stars and to have you be a contestant. How about there that? There we go. How about that? I Caitlin love it. The hosting I love job. It. I'm the contestant. They <laughs> fire me week one, and we're all happy. And we're I know that she's preparing you via TikTok with all these dances. You okay. Want to know, let me tell you what show I want to go on. Like if I could put anything what out show? there, anyone out there is listening. I want to go on Big Brother. I wow. love that show. Game theory. It's like strategy, manipulation, game theory. It's like, it's a whole different side of people that you would never see in like an open, vulnerable dating show. Interesting. Okay. So if anyone from the executive team at Big Brother is listening, call Jason me. wants to come on. Call, <laughs> give him a call. All right. We're going to end this episode of Reinvented with a quick, fun Jason Jen rapid fire round. I've started doing this with a lot of my guests and it's always a fan favorite. So Jason, are you ready? Let's go. Fire away. Okay, strap in. Which do you prefer, texting or talking on the phone? I prefer uh, none of the above audio notes. Audio notes? Oh, audio those notes. Are the if worst. you are, in, they are the best. You oh. don't have to type. You don't have to look down. It's efficient. It's quick. I get to hear someone's voice. I'm not trying to interpret their text. Audio notes, people. I don't have to small talk for eight hours yeah, on, a, yeah, yeah. on a cell phone call. Yeah. Boom. Audio notes. Try Except them before you like hate them. My item. publicist sends me like 10 minute long audio notes. And I'm no, 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 like, no. Okay. The, there's one rule with audio notes 30 okay. seconds and less. Over oh, 30 seconds okay. are shot. Yep. I can get on board with that. All right. <laughs> Favorite holiday. Oh, this is weird. People are going to judge me. Why? Ha- Halloween. Why is that weird? I don't know. It's like that's it's my like favorite holiday. holiday. Ho- I love Halloween. Like I, I love think Halloween it's so too. Much fun. The only thing I don't like about Halloween is usually families not incorporated. But other than that, the friends, the parties, the dressing up, the excitement, yeah. I'm here for it. What was your last Halloween costume? We were <laughs> we were broken down uh rose and jack from oh Titanic. i saw that on social media yeah, yeah. We, had, we had our buddy he was the actual jack and rose. uh the he was the he was the um the door you know the, the door, door <laughs> that rose yes. is on yes so he was the yes. door wobbling around while i was like falling yeah. off <laughs> was rose selfish for not letting jack dawson on the door of the titanic yes or no uh, i've always thought that she was until i believe the creator of the show recently, I think it was Spielberg came out and said, yeah. uh, if you do the physics and the dynamics of everything, there's no way Jack would have made it. And like, he totally debunked the theory. So oh, you got to go with logic. Numbers don't lie. People do. Okay. All right. <laughs> First celebrity crush. The, uh, the pink power ranger. Duh. Oh, okay. I get that. <laughs> remember, remember the power ranger. I get it. I get it. Do you snore? Yes. Oh, okay. I know. It's not good. That's really more embarrassing than Halloween being yeah, here. I, I actually, I found out, I actually went to a doctor about it. I found out I have a deviated septum. I think I have to get surgery. So oh, that man. sucks. Or is it like <laughs> the deviated septum where people go in for a nose job? I'm kidding. That's what I was told. I didn't realize that was a thing. I'm like, <laughs> Oh, no, it's I such was... a thing. It yeah. is such a thing. Yeah. Um, all right. Say a word in Spanish. Um, me llamo Hassan. See, I knew you were going to get all like fancy with it. <laughs> I've asked Chris Jericho and like his response was like, hola. And I asked uh, Billy Corgan, his was like, see. And of course you give me this whole um, <laughs> phrase. So that's great. Uh, okay. Would you rather cuddle a baby panda or a baby penguin? A baby penguin. That's in weird fact, to me. I, yeah. A lot of people say that. In fact, I've always said I want a penguin as a, uh, I want a penguin as a pet. I think they're so cool. They just like waddle around. They kind of skate on their stomachs. Like I like when we go to the zoo and stuff, I love seeing penguins. I just think they're so fascinating. Okay. All right. Godfather or Star Wars? Godfather. Oh, okay. Uh, Shake Shake Shack or In-N-Out Burger. Now those are fighting words here in Manhattan. Yeah, I am. I am definitely a Shake Shack guy. Yes. In and out oh. is so overrated. Yes, I suck. knew I liked like, you. Oh, you know, I liked do all this with the onion, all these like secrets. It's so talk. overrated. I'm out. Agreed. I'm out and the whole like thing with the lettuce bun, like yeah. what is and that? These stupid lines yeah. are ridiculous. It's so overhyped. Yep. Yep. Like, Good. <laughs> okay, we can stay friends now. Uh, name one of the seven dwarfs. A sleepy. Okay. Uh, what's your death row meal? Buffalo chicken wings. 
Interesting. All right. Okay. Last question. If I could ensure that the Buffalo Bills would win the Super Bowl, Jason, mm-hmm. would you get a face tattoo? <laughs> How big does the face tattoo have to be? I, I mean, it's, it's on your face. So it's like, there. But you're telling me I could like just get it like mm, with that account right no, there? No, no. It's got to be a little more. Like the size like, of a quarter? I, like Mike Tyson style. You know? Like my whole fucking face? <laughs> <laughs> it's a face tattoo. <laughs> oh my. Think God. about it, though. Yes. I would you know ensure what? that Here's your boys answer. would win the Super Bowl. I would get a face tattoo if you guaranteed me the Buffalo Bills won a Super Bowl. I would do it. I would okay. do it. If you, you guaranteed it. it, I would do okay. it. Okay. Wow. It. You, heard it, it. you, heard, you it right heard it here. You heard it here. If, if you they... guaranteed me a Bills Super Bowl, I'd get a face tattoo. Okay. You're on. I will take that bet, and <laughs> you are on. <laughs> <laughs> Jason Tartik, you are a delight and just an all around awesome dude. Thank you so much for coming on the Reinvented podcast and for sharing a little bit about your personal journey of reinvention and restarting one's career path. You are so well prepared. Thank you so much for coming on, Jen. It's been a pleasure. To all my viewers and listeners, be sure to pick up a copy of Jason's book, The Restart Roadmap, and check out his podcast called Trading Secrets, where him and experts unlock trading and investment secrets and dive into anything and everything finance. As for this podcast, be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to Reinvented. That's available wherever you listen to podcasts, Spotify, Apple, YouTube, you name it, it's there. Go ahead, give it five stars and a nice review. We love that. I'm Jen Eckhart. That was Jason Tartik. Thank you for listening.